The Cybrarian presents Robert E. Howard's Cull the Conqueror The Cat and the Skull Disclaimer The following may contain violence, references to sex, and language that may affect. Music by Solo Frame. Images by Alex Hollywood, Anna Roswadowska, and Eberhard Roskowski. King Cull went with two, chief counsellor of the throne, to see the talking cat of Del Cardes. For though a cat may look at a king, it is not given every king to look at a cat like Del Cardes's. So Cull forgot the death threat of Thulsa Doom, the necromancer, and went to Del Cardes. Cull was sceptical, and too was wary and suspicious, without knowing why. But years of counterplot and intrigue had soured him. He swore testily that a talking cat was a snare and a fraud, a swindle and a delusion, and maintained that should such a thing exist, it was a direct insult to the gods, who ordained that only man should enjoy the power of speech. But Cull knew that in old times beasts had talked to men, for he had heard the legends, handed down from his barbarian ancestors. So he was sceptical, but open to conviction. Del Cardes helped the conviction. She lounged with supple ease upon her silk couch, herself like a great beautiful feline, and looked at Cull from under long, drooping lashes, which led an imaginable charm to her narrow, piquantly slanted eyes. Her lips were full and red, and unusually, as at present, curved in a faint enigmatic smile, and her silken garments and ornaments of gold and gems had little of her glorious figure. But Cull was not interested in women. He ruled Volusia, but for all that he was an Atlantean and a ferocious savage in the eyes of his subjects. War and conquest held his attention. Together with keeping his feet on the ever-rocking throne of the ancient empire and the task of learning the ways, customs and thoughts of the people he ruled, and the threats of Thulsa Doom. To Cull, Del Cardes was a mysterious and queenly figure, alluring yet surrounded by a haze of ancient wisdom and womanly magic. To Tu, Chief Counselor, she was a woman, and therefore the latent base of intrigue and danger. To Ka Nu, Pictish ambassador and Cull's closest advisor, she was an eager child, parading under the effect of her show acting but Kanu was not there when Cull came to see the talking cat. The cat lolled on a silken cushion, on a couch of her own, and surveyed the king with inscrutable eyes. Her name was Saremes, and she had a slave who stood behind her, ready to do her bidding. A lanky man who kept the lower part of his face half concealed by a thin veil which fell to his chest. King Cull, said Del Cardes. I crave a boon of you. Before Saranez begins to speak, when I must be silent. You may speak, Cull answered. The girl smiled eagerly and clasped her hands. Let me marry Kolera Thum of Zarhana. Two broke in as Cull was about to speak. My lord, this matter has been thrashed out at length before. I thought there was some purpose in requesting this visit. This... This girl has a strain of royal blood in her, and it is against the custom of Valusia that the royal women should marry foreigners of lower rank. But the king can rule otherwise, pouted Del Cardes. My lord, said Two, spreading his hands as one in the last stages of nervous irritation. If she marries thus, it is like to cause war and rebellion and discord for the next hundred years. He was about to plunge into a dissertation on rank, genealogy and history, but Cull interrupted, his short stock of patience exhausted. Valka and Hotath, 
Am I an old woman or a priest to be bedeviled with such affairs? Settle it between yourselves and vex me no more with questions of mating. By Valka, in Atlantis, men and women marry whom they please and none else. Delcardes pouted a little and made a face at two who scowled back, then smiled sunnily and turned on her couch with a lissome movement. Talk to Saremes, Cal. She will grow jealous of me. Cal eyed the cat uncertainly. Her fur was long, silky and grey, her eyes slanting and mysterious. She is very young, Cal, yet she is very old, said Del Cardes. She is a cat of the old race, who lived to be thousands of years old. Ask her her age, Cal. How many years have you seen, Saramis? Asked Cal idly. Velusia was young when I was old, the cat answered in a clear, though curiously timbered voice. Cal started violently. Valka and Hatath, he swore. She talks. Declardes laughed softly in pure enjoyment, but the expression of the cat never altered. I talk, I think, I know, I am. I have been the ally of queens and the counsellor of kings ages before. Even the white beaches of Atlantis knew your feet, Cull of Valusia. I saw the ancestors of the Valusians ride out of the Far East to trample down the old race. And I was here when the old race came up out of the oceans so many eons ago that the mind of man reels when seeking to measure them. Older am I than Thulsa Doom, whom few men have ever seen. I have seen empires rise and kingdoms fall, and kings ride in on their steeds and out on their shields. I, I have been a goddess in my time, and strange were the neophytes who bowed before me, and terrible were the rites which were performed in my worship to pleasure me. Four of eld beings exalted my kind, beings as strange as their deeds. Can you read the stars and foretell events? Cull's barbarian mind leapt at once to material ideas. Aye, the books of the past and the future are open to me, and I tell man what is good for him to know. Then tell me, said Cull. Where I misplaced the secret letter from Kanu yesterday. You thrust it into the bottom of your dagger scabbard and then instantly forgot it. The cat replied. Cull started, snatched at his dagger and shook the sheath. A thin strip of folded parchment tumbled out. Valka and Hatath, he swore. Saramez, you are a witch of cats. Marquis too. But Two's lips were pressed in a straight, disapproving line, and he eyed Delcardes darkly. She returned his stare guilelessly, and he turned to cull in irritation. My lord, consider, this is all mummery of some sort. Two, none saw me hide that letter, for I myself had forgotten. Lord King, any spy might spy. Be not a greater fool than you were born to. Shall a cat set spies to watch me hide letters? Two sighed. As he grew older, it was becoming increasingly difficult to refrain from showing exasperation toward kings. My lord, give thought to the humans who may be behind the cat. Lord, too, said Delcardes, in a tone of gentle reproach. You put me to shame and you offend, Saremes. Cull felt vaguely angered at two. At least two, said he. The cat talks that you cannot deny. There is some trickery, two stubbornly maintained. Man talks, beasts may not. Not so, said Cull, himself convinced of the reality of the talking cat and anxious to prove the rightness of his belief. A lion talked to Canberra, and birds have spoken to the old men of the Sea Mountain tribes. 
telling them where game was hidden. None deny that beasts talk amongst themselves. Many a night I have lain on the slopes of the forest-covered hills, or out on the grassy savannas, and have heard the tigers roaring to one another across the starlight. Then why should some beast not learn the speech of man? There have been times when I could almost understand the roaring of the tigers. The tiger is my totem, and his taboo to me save in self-defense, he added irrelevantly. Two squirmed. This talk of totem and taboo was good enough for a savage chief, but to hear such remarks from the king of Volusia irked him extremely. My lord, said he, a cat is not a tiger. Very true, said Cull. And this one is wiser than all tigers. That is naught but truth, said Saremes calmly. Lord Chancellor, would you believe me then, if I told you what was at this moment transpiring in the royal treasury? No, two snarled. Clever spies may learn anything as I have found. No man can be convinced when he will not, said Saremes imperturbably, quoting a very old Valusian saying. Yet know, Lord, too, that a surplus of twenty gold tiles has been discovered, and a courier is even now hastening through the streets to tell you of it. Ah, uh, as a step sounded in the corridor without, even now he comes. A slim courtier, clad in the gay garments of the royal treasury, entered, bowing deeply, and craved permission to speak. Carl having granted it, he said, Mighty king and lord too, a surplus of twenty thousand of gold has been found in the royal monies. <laughs> Delcardes laughed and clapped her hands delightedly, but too merely scowled. When was this discovered? A scant half hour ago. How many have been told of it? N none, my lord. Only I and the royal treasurer have known until just now when I told you, my lord. <clears throat> Two waved him aside sourly. Be gone. I will see about this matter later. Delcardes, said Cull. This cat is yours, is she not? Lord King, answered the girl. No one owns Saremes. She only bestows on me the honour of her presence. She is a guest. As for the rest, she is her own mistress and has been for a thousand years. I would that I might keep her in the palace, said Cull. Saremes, said Delcardes deferentially. The king would have you as his guest. I will go with the king of Volusia, said the cat with dignity, and remain in the royal palace until such time as it shall pleasure me to go elsewhere. For I am a great traveller, Cull, and it pleases me at times to go out over the world path and walk the streets of cities where in ages gone I have roamed forests, and to tread the sands of deserts where long ago I trod imperial streets. So Saramez, the talking cat, came to the royal palace of Valusia. Her slave accompanied her, and she was given a spacious chamber, lined with fine couches and silken pillows. The best viands of the royal table were placed before her daily, and all the household of the king did homage to her, except two, who grumbled to see a cat exalted, even a talking cat. Saramez treated him with amused contempt, but admitted Cull into a level of dignified equality. She quite often came into his throne chamber, borne on a silken cushion by her slave who must always accompany her, no matter where she went. At other times, Cull came into her chamber, and they talked into the dim hours of dawn, and many were the tales she told him, and ancient the wisdom that she imparted. Cull listened with interest and attention, for it was evident that this cat was wiser far than many of his counsellors and had gained more antique wisdom than all of them together. Her words were pithy and oracular, and she refused to prophesy beyond minor affairs, taking place in the everyday life of the palace and kingdom, save that she warned him against Thulsa Doom, who had sent a threat to Cull. For, she said, I who have lived more years than you shall live minutes, know that man, 
is better without knowledge of things to come. For what is to be will be, and man can neither avert nor hasten. It is better to go in the dark when the road must pass a lion, and there is no other road. Yet, said Cull, if what must be is to be, a thing which I doubt, and a man be told what things shall come to pass, and his arm weakened or strengthened thereby, then was not that too foreordained. If he was ordained to be told, said Serenus, adding to Cull's perplexity and doubt. However, not all of life's roads are set fast. For a man may do this, or a man may do that, and not even the gods know the mind of a man. Then, said Cull dubiously, all things are not destined, if there be more than one road for a man to follow. And how can events then be prophesied truly? Life has many roads, Cull, answered Saremus. I stand at the crossroads of the world and I know what lies down each road. Still, not even the gods know what road a man will take, whether the right hand or the left hand, when he comes to the dividing of the ways, and once started upon a road, he cannot retrace his steps. Then in Valka's name, said Cull, why not point out to me the perils or advantages of each road as it comes, and aid me in choosing. Because there are bounds set upon the powers of such as I, lest we hinder the workings of the alchemy of the gods. We may not brush the veil entirely aside for human eyes, lest the gods take our power from us, and lest we do harm to man. For though there are many roads at each crossroads, still a man must take one of those, and sometimes one is no better than another. So hope flickers her lamp along one road and man follows, though that road may be the foulest of all. Then she continued, seeing Cull find it difficult to understand. You see, Lord King, that our powers must have limits, else we might grow too powerful and threaten the gods. So a mystic spell is laid upon us, and while we may open the books of the past, we may but grant flying glances of the future through the mist that veils it. Cull felt somehow that the argument of Saremes was rather flimsy and illogical smacking of witchcraft and mummery, but with Ceramus's cold, oblique eyes gazing unwinkingly at him, he was not prone to offer any objections, even had he thought of any. Now, said the cat, I will draw aside the veil for an instant to your own good. Let Del Cardez marry Calrathon. Cull rose with an impatient twitch of his mighty shoulders. I will have naught to do with a woman's mating. Let two attend to it. Yet Cull slept on the thought, and as Ceremus wove the advice craftily into her philosophizing and moralizing in days to come, Cull weakened. A strange sight it was indeed to see Cull, his chin resting on his great fist, leaning forward and drinking in the distinct intonations of the cat Saremes, as she lay curled on her silken cushion, or stretched languidly at full length, as she talked of mysterious and fascinating subjects, her eyes glinting strangely and her lips scarcely moving, or not at all, while the slave Cthulhus stood behind her like a statue, motionless and speechless. Cull highly valued her opinions, and he was prone to ask her advice, which she gave warily or not at all, on matters of state. Still, Cull found that what she advised usually coincided with his private wishes, and he began to wonder if she were not a mind-reader also. Cuthalos irked him with his gauntness, 
his motionlessness, and his silence. But Saremis would have none other to attend her. Cull strove to pierce the veil that masked the man's features, but though it seemed thin enough, he could tell nothing of the face beneath, and out of courtesy to Saremis, never asked Cothalos to unveil. Cull came to the chamber of Saremis one day, and she looked at him with enigmatical eyes. The masked slave stood statue-like behind her. Cull, said she, again I will tear the veil for you. Brul, the Pictish spear slayer, warrior of Kanu, and your friend, has just been hauled beneath the surface of the Forbidden Lake by a grisly monster. Cull sprang up, cursing in rage and alarm. Huh! Brule! Varka's name! What was he doing about the Forbidden Lake? He was swimming there. Hasten, you may yet save him, even though he be born to the enchanted land which lies below the lake. Cull whirled towards the door. He was startled, but not so much as he would have been had the swimmer been someone else. For he knew the reckless irreverence of the Pict, chief among Volusia's most powerful allies. He started to shout for the guards, when Sarima's voice stayed him. Nay, my lord, you had best go alone. Not even your command might make men accompany you into the waters of that grim lake. And by the custom of Volusia, it is death for any man to enter there save the king. Aye, I will go alone, said Cull, and thus save Brule from the anger of the people should he chance to escape the monsters. Inform Kanu. Cull, discouraging respectful inquiries with wordless snarls, mounted his great stallion and rode out of Volusia at full speed. He rode along and he ordered none to follow him. That which he had to do, he could do alone and he did not wish anyone to see when he brought Brule or Brule's corpse out of the Forbidden Lake. He cursed the reckless inconsideration of the Pict, and he cursed the tambu which hung over the lake, the violation of which may cause rebellion among the Volusians. Twilight was stealing down from the mountains of Salgara when Cull halted his horse on the shores of the lake that lay amid a great lonely forest. There was certainly nothing forbidding in its appearance, for its waters spread blue and placid from beach to wide white beach, and the tiny islands rising above its bosom seemed like gems of emerald and jade. A faint shimmering mist rose from it, enhancing the air of lazy unreality which lay about the regions of the lake. Cull listened intently for a moment, and it seemed to him as though faint and far away music breathed up through the sapphire waters. He cursed impatiently, wondering if he were beginning to be bewitched, and flung aside all garments and ornaments except his girdle, loincloth, and sword. He waded out into the shimmery blueness until it lapped at his thighs. Then knowing that the depth swiftly increased, he drew a deep breath and dived. As he swam down through the sapphire glimmer, he had time to reflect that this was probably a fool's errand. He might have taken time to find from Saramis just where Brule had been swimming when attacked, and whether he was destined to rescue the warrior or not. Still, he thought that the cat might not have told him, and even if she had assured him of failure, he would have attempted what he was doing now anyway. So there was truth in Saramis's saying that men were better untold then. As for the location of the lake battle, the monster might have dragged Brule anywhere. He intended to explore the lake bed until, even as he ruminated thus, a shadow flashed by him, a vague shimmer in the jade and sapphire shimmer of the lake. He was aware that other shadows swept by him on all sides, but he could not make out their form. Far beneath him he began to see the glimmer of the lake bottom which seemed to glow with a strange radiance. Now the shadows were all about him. They wove a serpentine about and in front of him, an ever-changing, thousand-hued, glittering web of colour. 
The water here burned topaz, and the things wavered and scintillated in its fairy splendour. Like the shades and shadows of colour they were, vague and unreal, yet opaque and gleaming. However, Cull, deciding they had no intention of attacking him, gave them no more attention, but directed his gaze on the lake floor, which his feet just then struck, lightly. He started, and could have sworn that he had landed on a living creature, for he felt a rhythmic movement beneath his bare feet. The faint glow was evident there at the bottom of the lake. As far as he could see it stretching away on all sides until it faded into the lambent sapphire shadows. The lake floor was one solid level of fire that faded and glowed with unceasing regularity. Cull bent closer. The floor was covered by a sort of short, moss-like substance which shone like white flame. It was as if the lake bed were covered with myriads of fireflies which raised and lowered their wings together. And this moss throbbed beneath his feet like a living thing. Now Cull began to swim upward again. Raised among the sea mountains of ocean-girt Atlantis, he was like a sea creature himself, as much at home in the water as any Lemurian. He could remain under the surface twice as long as the ordinary swimmer, but this lake was deep, and he wished to conserve his strength. He came to the top, filled his enormous chest with air, and dived again. Again the shadows swept about him, almost dazzling his eyes with their ghostly gleams. He swam faster this time, and having reached the bottom, he began to walk along it, the while the fire moss breathed and glowed, and the colour of things flashed about him, and monstrous, nightmare shadows fell across his shoulder upon the burning floor, flung by unseen beings. The moss was littered by the skulls and bones of men who had dared the forbidden lake. And suddenly, with a silent swirl of waters, a thing rushed upon Cull. At first the king thought it to be a huge octopus, for the body was that of an octopus, with long, waving tentacles. But as it charged upon him, he saw it had legs, like a man, and a hideous, semi-human face leered at him from among the writhing, snaky arms of the monster. Cull braced his feet, and he felt the cruel tentacles whip about his limbs. He thrust his sword with cool accuracy into the midst of that demonic face, and the creature lumbered down and died at his feet, with grisly, soundless gibbering. Blood spread like a mist about him, and Cull thrust strongly against the floor with his legs and shot upward. He burst into the fast-fading light, and even as he did, a great form came skimming across the water towards him. A water spider. But this one was larger than a house, and its great, cold eyes gleamed hellishly. Cull, keeping himself afloat with his feet and one hand, raised his sword as the spider rushed in. He cleft it halfway through the body, and it sank silently. A slight noise made him turn, and another, larger than the first, was almost upon him. This one flung over the king's arms and shoulders great strands of clinging web that would have meant doom for any but a giant. But Cull burst the grim shackles as if they had been strings and seizing a leg of the thing as it towered above him. He thrust the monster through again and again till it weakened in his grasp and floated away, reddening the blue waters. <sighs> Valka, muttered the king. I am not like to go without employment here. Yet these things be easy to slay. How could they have overcome Brule, who in all the seven kingdoms is second only to me in battle might? But Cull was to find that grimmer spectres than these haunted the death-ridden abysses of Forbidden Lake. Again he died, and this time only the colour shadows and the bones of forgotten men met his glance. Again he rose for air, and for the fourth time he died. He was not far from one of the islands, and as he swam downward, he wondered what strange things were hidden by the dense emerald foliage which cloaked these islands. 
Legend said that temples and shrines reared there that were never built by human hands. And that on certain nights the lake beings came out of the depths to enact eerie rites there. The rush came just as his feet struck the moss. It came from behind and Cull, warned by some primal instinct, whirled just in time to see a great form loom over him. A form neither man nor beast but horribly compounded of both. To feel gigantic fingers close on arm and shoulder. He struggled savagely, but the thing held his sword arm helpless, and its talons sank into his left forearm. With a volcanic wrench, he twisted about so that he could at least see his attacker. The thing was something like a monstrous shark, but a long, cruel horn curved like a saber, jutted up from its snout, and it had four arms. Human in shape, but inhuman in size and strength, and in the crooked talons of the fingers. With two arms, the monster held Cull helpless, and with the other two, it bent his head back to break his spine. But not even such a grim being as this might so easily conquer Cull of Atlantis. A wild rage surged up in him, and the king of Elusia went berserk. Racing his feet against the yielding moss, he tore his left arm free with a heave and wrench of his great shoulders. With cat-like speed, he sought to shift the sword from right hand to left, and failing in this, struck savagely at the monster with clenched fist. But the mocking Sephirian stuff about him foiled him, breaking the force of his blow. The shark man lowered his snout, but before he could strike upward, Cull gripped the horn with his left hand and held fast. Then followed a test of might and endurance. Cull, unable to move with any speed in the water, knew his only hope was to keep in close and wrestle with his foe in such a manner as to counterbalance the monster's quickness. He strove desperately to tear his sword arm loose, and the shark man was forced to grasp it with all four of his hands. Cull gripped the horn and dared not let go lest he be disemboweled with its terrible upward thrust. And the shark man dared not release, with a single hand, the arm that held Cull's long sword. So they wrenched and wrestled, and Cull saw that he was doomed if it went on in this manner. Already he was beginning to suffer for want of air. The gleam in the cold eyes of the shark man told that he too recognised the fact that he had but to hold Cull below the surface until he drowned. A desperate plight indeed for any man, but Cull of Atlantis was no ordinary man. Trained from babyhood in a hard and bloody school, with steel muscles and dauntless brain bound together by the coordination that makes the super fighter, he added to this a courage which never faltered and a tigerish rage which on occasion swept him up to superhuman deeds. So now, conscious of his swiftly approaching doom and goaded to frenzy by his helplessness, he decided upon an action as desperate as his need. He released the monster's horn, at the same time bending his body back as far as he could and gripping the nearest arm of the thing with his free hand. Instantly the shark man struck, his horn ploughing along Cull's thigh and then the luck of Atlantis, wedging fast in Cull's heavy gurgle. And as he tore it free, Cull sent his mighty strength through the fingers that held the monster's arm and crushed clammy flesh and inhuman bone like rotten fruit between them. The shark man's mouth gave silently with the torment and he struck again, wildly. Cull avoided the blow and losing their balance, they went down together, half buoyed by the jade surge in which they wallowed. And as they tossed there, Cull tore his sword arm from the weakening grip and striking upward, split the monster open. The whole battle had consumed only a very brief time, but to Cull, as he swam upward, his head singing and a great weight seeming to press his ribs, it seemed like hours. He saw dimly that the lake floor shelved suddenly upward, close at hand, and knew that it sloped to an island. The water became alive about him, and he felt himself lapped from shoulder to heel in gigantic coils, which even steel muscles could not break. His consciousness was fading. He felt himself borne along at terrific speed. There was a sound as of many bells. Then suddenly 
he was above water and his tortured lungs were drinking in great draughts of air. He was whirling along through utter darkness and had time only to take a long breath before he was again swept under. Again light glowed about him and he saw the fire moss throbbing far below. He was in the grasp of a great serpent who had flung a few lengths of sinuous body about him like huge cables and was now bearing him to what destination Valka alone knew. Cull did not struggle, reserving his strength. If the snake did not keep him so long under water that he died, there would no doubt be a chance of battle in the creature's lair or wherever he was being taken. As it was, Cull's limbs were pinioned so close that he could no more free an arm than he could have flown. The serpent, racing through the blue deep so swiftly, was the largest Cull had ever seen, a good 200 feet of jade and golden scales, vividly and wonderfully coloured. Its eyes, when they turned towards Cull, were like icy fire if such a thing can be. Even Cull's imaginative soul was struck with the bizarreness of the scene, that great green and gold form flying through the burning topaz of the lake, while the shadow colours weaved dazzlingly about it. The fire-gemmed floor sloped upwards again, either for an island or for the lake shore, and a great cavern suddenly appeared before them. The snake glided into this. The fire moss ceased, and Cull found himself partly above the surface in unlighted darkness. He was borne along in this manner for what seemed like a very long time. Then the monster died again. Again they came up into the light, but such light as Cull had never seen before. A luminous glow shimmered duskily over the face of the waters which lay dark and still. And Cull knew that he was in the enchanted domain under the bottom of the forbidden lake. For this was no earthly radiance. It was black light, blacker than any darkness, yet it lit the unholy waters so that he could see the dusky glimmer of them and his own dark reflections in them. The coil suddenly loosened from his limbs and he struck out for a vast bulk that loomed in the shadows in front of him. Swimming strongly, he approached and saw that it was a great city. On a great level of black stone, it towered up and up until its sombre spires were lost in the blackness above the unhallowed light, which, black also, was yet of a different hue. Huge, square-built, massive buildings of mighty basaltic-like rocks fronted him as he clambered out of the clammy waters and strode up the steps which were cut into the stone, like steps in a wharf, and between the buildings, columns rose gigantically. No gleam of earthly light lessened the grimness of this inhuman city, but from its walls and towers the black light flowed out over the waters in vast, throbbing waves. Cull was aware that in a wide space before him, where the buildings swept away on each side, a huge concourse of beings confronted him. He blinked, striving to accustom his eyes to the strange illumination. The beings came closer, and a whisper ran among them like the waving of grass in the night wind. They were light and shadowy, glimmering against the blackness of their city, and their eyes were eerie and luminous. Then the king saw that one of their number stood in front of the rest. This one was much like a man, and his bearded face was high and noble, but a frown hovered over his magnificent brows. You come like the herald of all your race, said this lake man suddenly, bloody and bearing a red sword. Cull laughed angrily for this smack of injustice. <laughs> Valka and Hatath, said the king, most of this blood is mine own, and was let by things of your cursed lake. Death and ruin follow the course of your race, said the lake man somberly. Do we not know? I. We reigned in the lake of blue waters, before mankind was even a dream of the gods. None molest you, began Cull. They fear too. In the old days, 
Men of the earth sought to invade our dark kingdom, and we slew them. And there was war between the sons of men and the people of the lakes. And we came forth and spread terror among the earthlings, for we knew that they bore only death for us, and that they yielded only to slaying. And we wove spells and charms, and burst their brains, and shattered their souls with our magic. So they begged for peace, and it was so. The men of Earth lay the tambu on this lake so that no man may come here, save the king of Volusia. That was thousands of years ago. No man has ever come to the enchanted land and gone forth, save as a corpse floating up through the still waters of the upper lake. King of Volusia, or whoever you be, you are doomed. Cole snarled in defiance. I sought not your cursed kingdom. I seek Brule, the spear slayer whom you dragged down. You lie, the lake man answered. No man has dared this lake for over a hundred years. You come seeking treasure, or to ravish and slay, like all your bloody-handed kind. You die. And Cole felt the whisperings of magic charms about him. They filled the air and took physical form, floating in the shimmering light like wispy spider webs, clutching at him with vague tentacles. But Cole swore impatiently and swept them aside out of existence with his bare hand. For against the fierce elemental logic of the savage, the magic of decadency had no force. You are young and strong, said the late king. The rot of civilization has not yet entered your soul, and our charms may not harm you, because you do not understand them. Then we must try other things. And the lake beings about him drew daggers and moved upon Cull. Then the king laughed and set his back against a column, gripping his sword hilt until the muscles stood out on his right arm in great ridges. <laughs> this is a game I understand, ghosts, he laughed. They halted. Seek not to evade your doom, said the king of the lake, for we are immortal and may not be slain by mortal arms. You lie now, answered Cull, with the craft of the barbarian, for by your own words, you feared the death my kind brought among you. You may live forever, but steel can slay you. Take thought among yourselves. You are soft and weak, and unskilled in arms. You bear your blades unfamiliarly. I was born and bred to slaying. You will slay me, for there are thousands of you, and I but one. Yet your charms have failed and many of you shall die before I fall. I will slaughter you by the scores and the hundreds. Take thought, men of the lake. Is my slaying worth the lives it will cost you? For Cull knew that beings who slay may be slain by steel, and he was unafraid. A figure of threat and doom, bloody and terrible, he loomed above them. I consider he repeated. Is it better that you should bring Brule to me and let us go, or that my corpse shall lie amid sore-torn heaps of your dead when the battle shout is silent? Nay, there be Picts and the Murians among my mercenaries who will follow my trail even into the Forbidden Lake and will drench the enchanted land with your gore if I die here. For they have their own tambus, and they wreck not of the tambus of the civilized races, nor care they what may happen to Volusia, but think only of me, who am of barbarian blood like themselves. 
the old world reels. Down the road to ruin and forgetfulness brooded the late king. And we that were all powerful in bygone days must brook to be bearded in our own kingdom by an arrogant savage. Swear that you will never set foot in the forbidden lake again and that you will never let the tambu be broken by others and you shall go free. First bring the spear slayer to me. No such man has ever come to this lake. Nay, the cat Saremus told me. Saremus? Aye, we knew her of old when she came swimming down through the green waters and abode for some centuries in the courts of the enchanted land. The wisdom of the ages is hers, but I knew not that she spoke the speech of earthly men. Still, there is no such man here, and I swear that- Swear not by gods or devils, Cull broke in. Give your word as a true man. I give it, said the late king, and Cull believed, for there was a majesty and a bearing about the being which made Cull feel strangely small and rude. And I, said Cull, give you my word, which has never been broken, that no man shall break the tambu or molest you in any way again. The late king replied with a stately inclination of his lordly head and a gesture of his hand. And I believe you. For you are different from any earthly man I ever knew. You are a real king, and what is greater, a true man. Cull thanked him and sheathed his sword, turning toward the steps. Know ye how to gain the outer world, king of Volusia? As to that, answered Cull, if I swim long enough, I suppose I shall find a way. I know that the serpent brought me clear through at least one island, and possibly many, and that we swam in a cave for a long time. You are bold, said the late king, but you might swim forever in the dark. He raised his hands, and a behemoth swam to the foot of the steps. A grim steed, said the late king but he will bear you safe to the very shore of the upper lake. A moment, said Cull. Am I at present beneath an island or the mainland? Or is this land in truth beneath the lake floor? You are at the center of the universe, as you are always. Time, place, and space are illusions. Having no existence save in the mind of man, which must set limits and bounds in order to understand, there is only the underlying reality, of which all appearances are but outward manifestations. Just as the upper lake is fed by the waters of this real one. Go now, king. For you are a true man, even though you be the first wave of the rising tide of savagery, which shall overwhelm the world ere it recedes. Cull listened, respectfully, understanding little, but realizing that this was high magic. He struck his hands with the late king, shuddering a little at the feel of that which was flesh but not human flesh. Then he looked once more at the great black buildings rearing silently and the murmuring moth-like forms among them. And he looked out over the shiny jet surface of the waters, with the waves of black light crawling like spiders across it. And he turned and went down the stair to the water's edge and sprang on the back of the behemoth. Aeons followed, 
of dark caves and rushing waters and the whisper of gigantic unseen monsters. Sometimes above and sometimes below the surface, the behemoth bore the king and finally the fire moss leapt up and they swept up through the blue of the burning water and Cull waded to land. Cull's stallion stood patiently where the king had left him and the moon was just starting to rise over the lake, whereat Cull swore amazedly. A scant hour ago, by Valka, I dismounted here. I had thought that many hours and possibly days had passed since then. He mounted and rode towards the city of Volusia, reflecting that there might have been some meaning in the late king's remarks about the illusion of time. Cull was weary, angry and bewildered. The journey through the lake had cleansed him of the blood, but the motion of the riding started the gash in his thigh to bleeding again. Moreover, the leg was stiff and irked him somewhat. Still, the main question that presented itself was that Saremis had lied to him, and either through ignorance or through malicious forethought had come near to sending him to his death. For what reason? Cull cursed, reflecting what two would say in the Chancellor's triumph. Still, even a talking cat might be innocently wrong, but hereafter Cull determined to lay no weight to the words of such. Cull rode into the silent, silvery streets of the ancient city, and the guard at the gate gaped at his appearance, but wisely refrained from questioning. He found the palace in an uproar, swearing he stalked to his council chamber and thence to the chamber of the cat Saremis. The cat was there, curled imperturbably on her cushion and gripped about the chamber, each striving to talk down the others, where two and the chief counsellors. The slave Cthulhus was nowhere to be seen. Cull was greeted by a wide acclamation of shouts and questions, but he strode straight to Saremis's cushion and glared at her. Saremis, said the king, you lied to me. The cat stared at him coldly, yawned and made no reply. Cull stood nonplussed and two seized his arm. Cull, where in Valka's name have you been? Whence this blood? Cull jerked loose irritably. Leave be, he snarled. This cat sent me on a fool's errand. Where is Brule? Cull? The king whirled and saw Brule stride through the door, his scanty garments stained by the dust of hard riding. The bronze features of the pict were immobile, but his dark eyes gleamed with relief. Name of the seven devils said the warrior testily, to hide this emotion. My raiders have combed the hells in the forest for you. Where have you been? Searching the waters of the Forbidden Lake for your worthless carcass, answered Cull with grim enjoyment of the pick's perturbation. Forbidden Lake? Brill exclaimed with the freedom of the savage. Are you in your dotage? What would I be doing there? I accompanied Kanu yesterday to the Zafhanan border and returned to here too ordering out all the army to search for you. My men have since then ridden in every direction, except the Forbidden Lake, where we never thought of going. Sorimus lied to me, and Cull began, but he was drowned out by a chatter of scolding voices, the main theme being that a king should never ride off so unceremoniously, leaving the kingdom to take care of itself. Silence! roared Cull, lifting his arms, his eyes blazing dangerously. Valka and Hatath! Am I an urchin to be rated for truancy? Two, tell me what has occurred. In the sudden silence which followed this royal outburst, two began. My lord, we have been duped from the beginning. This cat is, as I have maintained, a delusion and a dangerous <sighs> fraud. <laughs> Yet, my lord, have you never heard of men who could hurl their voice to a distance, making it appear that another spoke? or that invisible voices sounded. Cull flushed. Aye, by Valka. Fool that I should have forgotten. An old wizard of Lemuria had that gift. Yet who spoke the... Cotholus? exclaimed too. Fool I am not to have remembered Cotholus. A slave, aye, but the greatest scholar and the wisest man in all the seven empires. Slave of that she-fiend Del Cardes, who even now writhes on the rack. Cull <sighs> gave a sharp exclamation. Aye, said Tu grimly. 
When I entered and found that you had ridden away, none knew where, I suspected treachery, and I sat me down and thought hard. And I remembered Cothulus and his art of voice throwing, and of how the false cat had told you small things, but never great prophecies, giving false arguments for reason of refraining. So I knew that Del Cardes had sent you this cat, and Cthulhu's to befool you, and gain your confidence, and finally send you to your doom. So I sent for Del Cardes, and ordered her put to the torture, so that she might confess all. She planned cunningly, aye, Saramis must have her slave, Cthulhu's, with her at all time, while he talked through her mouth, and put strange ideas in your mind. Then where is Cthulhu's? asked Cull. He had disappeared when I came to Saramis's chamber, and he... Ho, oh, Cull! A cheery voice boomed from the door, and a bearded, elfish figure strode in, accompanied by a slim, frightened, girlish shape. Kanu! The Cardes! So they did not torture you after all? Oh, my lord! She ran to him and fell on her knees before him, clasping his feet. Oh, Cull, she wailed. They accuse me of terrible things. I am guilty of deceiving you, my lord. But I meant no harm. I only wish to marry Cull Ruthum. Cull raised her to her feet, perplexed but pitying her evident terror and remorse. Cull, said Kanu. It's a good thing I returned when I did. Else you and two had tossed the kingdom into the sea. Two snarled wordlessly, always jealous of the Pictish ambassador, who was also Cull's advisor. A return to find the whole palace in an uproar, men rushing hither and yon, and falling over one another and doing nothing. I sent Brule and his riders to look for you, and going to the torture chamber, Naturally, I went first to the torture chamber, since two was in charge. The Chancellor winced. Going to the torture chamber, Canu continued placidly. I found them about to torture little Del Cardes, who wept and told all she had to tell. But they did not believe her. She's only an inquisitive child, Cull, in spite of her beauty and all. So I brought her here. Now, Cull... Del Cardes spoke truth when she said Saremes was her guest and that the cat was very ancient. True, she is a cat of the old race and wiser than other cats, going and coming as she pleases, but still a cat. Del Cardes had spies in the palace to report to her such small things as the secret letter which she hid in your dagger sheath and the surplus in the treasury. The courtier who reported that was one of her spies, and had discovered the surplus and told her before the royal treasurer knew. Her spies were your most loyal retainers, and the things they told her harmed you not, and aided her whom they all love, for they knew she meant no harm. Her idea was to have Cthulhu, speaking through the mouth of Ceremis, gain your confidence through small prophecies and facts which anyone might know, such as warning you against Thulsa Doom, then, by constant urging you to let Kulrathum marry Del Cardes to accomplish what was Del Cardes's only desire. Then Cthulhu's turned traitor. And at that moment, there was a noise at the chamber door, and guards entered, hauling between them a tall, gaunt form, his face masked by a veil, his arms bound. Cthulhus. Aye, Cthulhus, said Carnu, but he seemed not at ease, and his eyes roved restlessly. Cthulhus, no doubt, with his veil over his face to hide the workings of his mouth and neck muscles as he talked through Saremis. Cull eyed the silent figure which stood there like a statue. A silence fell over the group, as if a cold wind had passed over them. There was a tenseness in the atmosphere. Delcardes looked at the silent figure, and her eyes widened, as the guards told her in tar sentences how the slave had been captured, while trying to escape from the palace down a little used corridor. The silence fell again, and more tensely, 
as Cull stepped forward and reached forth a hand to tear the veil from the hidden face. Through the thin fabric, Cull felt two eyes burn into his consciousness. None noticed Kanu clench his hands and tense himself as if for a terrific struggle. Then as Cull's hand almost touched the veil, a sudden sound broke the breathless silence. Such a sound as a man might make by striking the floor with his forehead or elbow. The noise seemed to come from a wall and Cull, crossing the room with a stride, smote against a panel from behind which the rapping sounded. A hidden door swung inward, revealing a dusty corridor upon which lay the bound and gagged form of a man. They dragged him forth and standing him upright, unbound him. Cthulhu's, shrieked Del Cardez. Cull stared. The man's face, now revealed, was thin and kindly, like a teacher of philosophy and morals. Yes, my lords and ladies, he said. That man who wears my veil stole upon me through the secret door, struck me down and bound me. I lay there, hearing him send the king to what he thought was Cull's death, but could do nothing. Then who is he? All eyes turned towards the veiled figure and stepped forward. Lord King, beware, exclaimed the real Cthulhus. He called tore the veil away with one motion and recoiled with a gasp. Delcardes screamed and her knees gave way. The councillors pressed backwards, faces white, and the guards released their grasp and shrank horror-struck away. The face of the man was a bare white skull in whose eye sockets flamed livid fire. False of doom! I have guessed as much, exclaimed Canu. I, thoughts of doom, fools. The voice echoed cavernously and hollowly. The greatest of all wizards and your eternal foe, Carl of Atlantis. You have won this tilt, but beware, there shall be others. He burst the bonds on his arms with a single contemptuous gesture and stalked towards the door, the throng giving back before him. You were a fool of no discernment, Cull, said he, else you had never mistaken that other fool, Cthulhu's, for me, even with the veil in his garments. Cull saw that it was so, for though the twain were alike in height and general shape, the flesh of the skull-faced wizard was like that of a man long dead. The king stood, not fearful like the others, but so amazed at the turn events had taken that he was speechless. Then, even as he sprang forward, like a man waking from a dream, Brule charged with the silent ferocity of a tiger, his curved sword gleaming. And like a gleam of light, it flashed into the ribs of Thulsa Doom, piercing him through and through, so that the point stood out between his shoulders. Brill regained his blade with a quick wrench as he leapt back. Then, crouching to strike again where it necessary, he halted. Not a drop of blood oozed from the wound, which in a living man had been mortal. The skull-faced one laughed. <laughs> Ages ago, I died as men die. He taunted. Nay, I shall pass to some other sphere when my time comes. Not before. I bleed not, for my veins are empty. I feel only a slight coldness which shall pass when the wound closes, as it is even now closing. Stand back, fool. Your master goes, but he shall come again to you, and you shall scream and shrivel and die in that coming. Cull, I salute you. And while Brul hesitated, unnerved, and Cull halted in undecided amazement, Thulsa Doom stepped through the door and vanished before their very eyes. At least, Cull, said Kanu later, you have won your first tilt with a skull-faced one as he admitted. Next time, we must be more wary, for he is a fiend incarnate, an owner of magic black and unholy. 
He hates you, for he is a satellite of the great serpent, whose power you broke. He has the gift of illusion and of invisibility, which only he possesses. He is grim and terrible. I fear him not, said Cull. The next time I will be prepared, and my answer shall be a sword thrust. Even though he be unslayable, which thing I doubt, Bull did not find his vitals, which even a living dead man must have. That is all. Then turning to Two, Lord Two, it would seem that the civilized races also have their taboos. Since the Blue Lake is forbidden to all save myself, Two answered testily, angry because Cull had given the happy Del Cardes permission to marry whom she desired. My lord, that is no heathen tambo such as your tribes bow to. It is a matter of statecraft to preserve peace between Volusia and the lake beings who are magicians. And we keep tambos so as not to offend unseen spirits of tigers and eagles, said Cull. And therein I see no difference. At any rate, said Tu, you must beware of Thol Sedum, for he vanished into another dimension, and as long as he is there, he is invisible and harmless to us. But he will come again. Ah, Cull, sighed the old rascal, Kanu. Mine is a hard life compared to yours. Brule and I were drunk in Zarfhana, and I fell down a flight of stairs, most damnably bruising my shins. And all the while, you lounged in sinful ease on the silk of the kingship, Cull. Cull glared at him, wordlessly, and turned his back, giving his attention to the drowsing Saremis. She is not a wizard beast, Cull, said the spear slayer. She is wise, but she merely looks her wisdom and does not speak. Yet her eyes fascinate me with their antiquity. A mere cat, just the same. Still, Bru, said Cull, admiringly, stroking her silky fur. Still she is a very ancient cat. Very. <laughs>